O să continuăm cu Pino, care a venit uh, special din America pentru noi astăzi, ceea ce eu spun că este o oportunitate fantastică să avem pe cineva cu atâta experiență în uh, vânzarea, cumpărarea de afaceri. Este membru al Consiliului Director al uh, IBBA, International Business Broker Association. Ai fost chairman of the board, nu? Dacă mi-aduc aminte bine. Ex-chairman ex of the board. Vrei microfonul? You on the mic? Sure. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for the op opportunity to um, share some of our thoughts and, and uh, experiences. Um, since this will not be part of my presentation, um, I'd like to perhaps um, address very quickly what I think is very interesting, and that is the uh, subject of being an inventor and a patent holder. Um, and I share this because I am a bit of an inventor as well, and I also am an owner of a patent or part owner of a patent. And I want to tell you, without hopefully taking any wind out of your sails, but the patent is really not worth a heck of a lot. Um, it is only worth a little bit of protection of what my colleague was talking about, and that is market. It's, it helps to protect your market. Um, but until that invention can create earnings, revenue, it can generate money, um, the patent itself isn't worth a lot. And so it's critical to be able to get, whether it's angel funding, uh, I don't know if you call that here, um, or, or if you have another name for it, or uh, the bank of mom and dad, as they say, um, in other words, family money, um, but some kind of funding to be able to get the product to market so that you can generate revenue. Once you're generating revenue, then you have something that becomes worth something. Until then, it's a concept. Uh, so I just wanted to address that very quickly, uh, simply because I don't have anything related to that uh, in my presentation. Um, I wanted to share uh, briefly, briefly with you um, some statistics here, and I'm hoping um, I need new glasses, so I'm hoping I'll be able to read that. Um, some of these small to mid-sized enterprises in the U.S., uh, this is statistics, there's about 30 million um, small to mid-sized enterprises in the United States. Uh, about 8.9 or 9 million employees, which is 47% or actually 48% round figures of uh, all employment is generated by the small to mid-sized enterprises and it provides almost 2 million new jobs every year. So the point of sharing some of these statistics with you is that we are to not underestimate the importance of entrepreneurship and business ownership. And we'll talk about the transition a little bit later. But the point that I am really focused on here is the fact that small to mid-sized enterprises are the backbone of every country's economy. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter whether you're in Romania or whether you are in Mexico or in the United States or in Canada or in the Netherlands or in France or in Belgium or wherever. That remains a fact. So in Canada, there's about uh, just over one million small to mid-sized enterprises. Um, they employ about uh, close to eight million people, uh, which represents almost 70% of all employment in the country. That's huge. The rest is obviously government. Uh, and it provides about 100,000 new jobs uh, each year. Um, in Europe, 
there's almost 25,000 SMEs. So this is pretty staggering, pretty staggering numbers. Uh, 94 million employees representing 66%. And it provides 86% of all new jobs. That's amazing. 86% of all new jobs. So the power of entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship I should say, or even better, the power of business ownership is not to be underestimated in terms of what small to mid-sized enterprises do for a country's economy. And so when we talk about transition of a business, you know, you have a business, it's a small little business, it does about a hundred thousand in turnover, whether it's dollars or euros or bronze or whatever, it's a tiny little business. And this tiny little business perhaps can't afford to get a brokerage, to transfer them, to sell it. Perhaps nobody cares because it's such a small business, it doesn't pay. We need to really consider the impact that the closure of such small businesses has on the economy of each and every country. Just imagine how many businesses, out of those numbers, out of the 30 million SMEs in the US, out of 25 million SMEs in Europe, and uh, almost, uh, yeah, just over 1 million SMEs in Canada. What do you think? Does anybody have any idea what percentage has less than five employees? Anybody have any idea? The majority, yeah, 90 plus percent, it's huge. So ignoring those little businesses is ignoring a major storm that's going to come and wipe you out. So it's important to, uh, to reverend transition of small to mid-sized enterprises. The big businesses will come and go and transact. We don't have to put much effort into that. That will happen whether we do anything or not. But the small businesses require work. And they require work from professionals like you have seen here yesterday and you've seen here today. And, and whether it's brokers or service providers or consultants or, or advisors, it's through the work of and dedication of those people that I think the economies of each country will continue on. This is an interesting graph also. This is um, United States only startups versus exits. Uh, th and this is between 1992 and 2016. And look at the two graphs. Really, really interesting statistics. So the blue is the startups, and uh, it's supposed to be red or maroon or black, uh, whatever color you see, uh, are the exits. Can you see how they almost cancel each other out? Very interesting statistic. You will find much the same thing here in Europe. I just thought I would share that um, because you know, it, it's the rebirth, right? It's, um, you know, everyone that dies, there's another one that's born. So as sad as we are to see the death of people, we've got to enjoy and embrace the birth of people as well. Um, there's buyers and there's sellers. How many here are buyers? I think I... Was, I any buyers here? No buyers. How many? Somebody. Half, half. Okay. Uh, how many sellers? A few sellers. At least some that are willing to admit it. Um, so we have buyers and we have sellers. And there is a need. And the need is to be able to facilitate a transaction.
Um, and that transaction is not just about the money in the transaction, but it's about the transfer of ownership. It's about the transfer of that entrepreneurship. It's about the transfer and retainment of the economy of your country. So it's important. I have this thing called uh, Business GPS, which stand, stands for Growth, Planning and Succession. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, the TomTom Tom GPS, I mean, there's, that was one of, the, one of the first ones out there, but there's a gazillion of them out there today. Um, but really, growth planning and, and succession are important parts of a business transition. It's important for the country, again. It's important for the industry. It's important for the people. When we're talking about sellers, we really are looking at three circles here. There's three options that sellers have. They can exit or they can grow and then at some point exit. Suffice to say that everybody exits. If there's any entrepreneurs here that think that you're not going to exit, you won't live forever. Um, I, I know some of my colleagues earlier on talked about that. Um, there is no such thing as a no exit. It's either a voluntary exit where you exit in your own time and under your own terms, or an involuntary exit where, oops, I didn't prepare. Something happened. We, we call the dismal Ds in, in, the, in, in North America. It's death, disability divorce, those are all things that happen. And they happen from one minute to the next quite often. And if you're not prepared, you or your estate will suffer. And it's not just you and your estate. It's your legacy. It's your community. When a business goes down, the suppliers to that business suffer. The customers of that business suffer. It's a big circle. Another option you have is recapitalization. And I'm not sure whether um, uh, there's, there's much of that that goes on here, but we do uh, quite a bit of recapitalization in North America. And that is where you basically have been running the business for some time. The business is doing well. And uh, you really just want to take some chips off the table and grow the business. And we'll talk about this in a moment when that right time is. Because we all have the ability to take a business from here to here. But from here to here takes a different skill set. And from here to the next level, it takes a different skill set. So you've got to be able to identify that and you've got to be able to switch from one to the other. So recapitalization means you sell literally a portion of your shares or your equity within the company and you take some money off and somebody else comes in that has deeper pockets than you, that has more skill sets than you, and they take the company to the next level with you being in there and you being a part of that and being a part of that transition that was talked about this morning. Being able to transfer that quite often personal goodwill as we call it to commercial goodwill. And by doing that, you can then take a second bite of the apple, as we say, later on when, let's say that your company is worth a million euros today, and you sell the company, you get a million euros. But if your company is worth a million euros, and you recapitalize, and now you sell, let's say, 40% of your company, so you get 400,000 euros that you put in your pocket. You still have equity in there. 
right? You've retained equity. So now, when your business grows from here to here, you, your company now is no longer worth a million euros. Your company may now be worth 10 million euros. So now, your equity is worth a lot more. Your second bite of the apple is worth a lot more. You're going to get a lot more money. Let's say you retained, you sold 40%, you retained 60, right? 60% 60 of a million is 600,000. 60% of 10 million is 6 million. So your second bite of the apple can often be worth a lot more than the first bite. So recapitalization is always a good option too. And of course, growth. Um, you know, grow the company until you can and then you sell it. However, you need to be careful because quite often when you get to the top, it's easy to fall down the cliff. There's the old saying, you sell on the way up, and you buy on the way down, right? Um, this is the concept of the why, the how, and the when. You need to know what you're doing, you need to know why you're doing it, and how to do it. And if you don't know the how, what, and how, then you need to have somebody assist you with that. And this is what we do in the United States and in Canada where I'm residing. Um, our job is not just to broker a business, but to assist the buyer or the seller, or in many cases both, to ensure that they can continue to focus on running their business, which is what the seller does, and the buyer can focus on buying the business, while we focus on making sure that they do everything right, that they check every box. Because in transitioning a business, one little mistake can cost a lot of money. In fact, it can cost the business. So here's a reality check for sellers. Uh, we talked about um, voluntary and involuntary exits. Uh, you can see in a voluntary exit, which is a planned exit, it could be the reason could be retirement. Uh, it could be that there's other interest, perhaps um, somebody who's not of retirement age, perhaps somebody that is in their 30s or 40s or even 50s, but they're bored, they want to do something else. You know, entrepreneurs have this disease, and the disease is that, you know, they, they're excited about the startup, they're excited about building it, but once it gets to a certain level, they get bored. And then at that point, the business does this. And you've got to recognize that as a seller. And if you don't, you'll see what happens a little later on. I have an animation to, to show you. Um, a lifestyle change. Somebody's tired of the hustle and bustle. They need to perhaps go into a more relaxing environment. Uh, they're tired of the, um, the pressures of entrepreneurship, perhaps. And they want to move from Bucharest to the countryside because they want to they slow down. A partner buyout where the relationship is no longer what it was. The partner now wants to buy you out. You, you know, uh, boredom. Uh, that's related to other interests, really. You know, those entrepreneurs get bored after a certain stage, and so they need to do something else. The unplanned or involuntary exits, well, it could be family issues, uh, could be death or disability, could be illness, could be divorce, could be disputes between partners, skill set limitations, although that skill set limitations could be on either side. If you recognize it, it will be on that side. If you don't, it's going to take you down, and it will be on that side. That side for you, I, I guess. Um, or just an opportunity to sell the business where somebody knocks on your door and says, I'd like to buy your business. Oh. So the question is, are you prepared? 
that's that GPS come, that comes into, into play. If you're not prepared, you're not going to have the maximum value, value of your business. So here's my animated graph of the typical life cycle of a business. The, um, you can see we have a startup. The entrepreneur gets excited, builds the business and grows the business. However, as I said, the entrepreneurial disease is such that you build it to a certain stage and then you get bored. And so whether you get bored or whether your skill sets have now reached the limitation, there could be other factors, by the way, you know, market saturation and, and so on. But two of the major factors are boredom or skill set limitations. At that point, you can see that the business starts to flatten out. Well, that's not your maximum value. And if you don't do anything about it, you're going to start declining and you're going to go down the business will die. So it's important to recognize the point at which you need to do something. And that something is either the sale of the business, or you need to reju rejuvenate, recharge your batteries and grow it, or you need to recapitalize. One of those three things need to be done when you reach that point. And you need to recognize where that point is. You will know where that point is. All you have to do is look at your income statement. You'll, you can probably tell the last few years when you see your sales suddenly flatten out, you've got to ask yourself why. It's always easy to blame the market, but the market is one of the reasons as well. So you need to recognize, okay, if this is the market, then what do I need to do? Do I have the skill sets to go after another market or to expand the market? So the questions that we had in the, in the center, in the core of those three uh, circles uh, were, one of them was what? Um, well, you got to ask yourself, what are the tangible assets that you have in the business? You may have a business that's asset-based, so you have a lot of asset value. However, you need to bear in mind that the value of those assets, no different to the patent, the value of those assets are nothing more than liquidation value unless those assets can generate earnings. In which case, the highest value of those assets is what they generate in the earnings. Now, I often get asked the question, I have a company, I have a million dollars worth of assets. And I'm generating $150,000 or euros with worth of earnings. Earnings is the bottom line, not the top line. EBITDA seller discretionary earnings, however you want to identify it. And so now, you've got $150,000 in earnings, you might sell that business if you're lucky for half a million dollars. And you're going to come to me and you're going to say, I have a million dollars worth of assets and the business is only worth half a million? How does that make sense? Well, it does. I'll tell you why. You'd probably be better off to liquidate your assets because the value of those assets at liquidation value might be worth perhaps slightly more than what the business is worth itself. But if that business with a million dollars was generating half a million dollars worth of earnings, now the value of that business would probably be maybe one and a half, maybe two, maybe two and a half. So the value of a business is really what it can generate in earnings. That is the value. And a business that has a million dollars or a million euros worth of assets versus another business over here that has 
50,000 euros worth of assets and generating the same earnings, well, this business is a much more efficient business because you can generate the same earnings with this business with much earnings are more predictable over time. That business quite often can be worth more money. So what do you have to sell? What do you have in tangible assets? What do you have in intangible assets? Patents, proprietary um, um, processes and systems, um, um, moats, um, in other words, the ability to fend off or keep out competition. All of these things are value drivers and are worth something. Of course, the bottom line is always the earnings and cash flow itself. We talk about capital expenditure, which is the reinvestment of, that, of those earnings into the capital assets that you might have. And of course, how much debt do you have? Because at the end of the day, you go subtract that debt from either the proceeds of sale that you're going to get, or if a buyer is going to take on some debt, they're going to pay you less for, because they're going to offset that debt. They're not going to take it on for nothing. Um, and of course, transfer networking capital, which is something that um, I don't know about you people here in Europe, but certainly in the U.S., it is a subject that is so, so unknown. Most accountants do not clearly understand working capital. But I have to, I have to take just a couple of minutes to explain it to you because I've, I've made it uh, my, my beef, if you would, uh, to talk about working capital. Um, working capital is the equivalent to the blood in your body. If you have no blood, if you have low blood pressure, what's going to happen to you? I think we all know that. Let me give another example. If you have no fuel in your car, whether you're running on, on petrol, gasoline, whatever you want to call it, or diesel, or even electric, if there's no charge in the battery, how far do you think you're going to go with that car? You're not going to go very far. Well, a business is the car. The working capital is the fuel that propels the car. And if you are here and you want to, if, you go to if, if, if you're in point A and you want to go to point B and you know that your vehicle does so many liters per hundred kilometers, you know that you're going to need so much fuel. And let's assume for a moment that you need 50 liters of fuel to go from here to here. If you only have 30 liters in the tank, how are you going to get there? You're not. You have to stop and fuel up. Well, that's the basic discussion of working capital. So the question you have to ask yourself is this business, in order to run properly and in order to generate those earnings, how much working capital does it need? because that working capital has to be included in the transfer of that business. No different to the assets. Quite often I get asked the question, they, they say, okay, well, why don't, we sell the, 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 why don't we sell the business for half a million uh, euros and we'll sell the assets for whatever, 300,000 euros. You can't do that because without the assets, you don't generate the earnings. And without any earnings, there is no value in the business. Right? 
So much the same with working capital. If you take that working capital out, you're not going to operate the business. So a business that sells with working capital included is going to be worth more than one that is selling with working capital excluded because the buyer will have to take money out of his or her pocket in order to fuel the tank. Otherwise, they're not going to get there. They will not be able to operate the business. So working capital is, is a very important component in valuing a business. Uh, why is the reason we sell the business? And again, this morning, um, my colleagues talked about some of the reasons for selling a business. And some of those reasons we talked about here as well. But those are important. One of the earlier comments uh, this, in this morning's session was, when you are 75 years old, the buyer is going to know that you have a short runway left. Therefore, the negotiations are going to be very different than with a seller who's, say, 50 years old, because they've got a longer runway. They can hold it out. They don't have to sell it to you. They can wait for somebody that will give them more money. But at 75, how long are you going to wait? Till you're 80? Perhaps. 85? Perhaps. 90? Probably not. So the why is important. Um, what's the reason for selling a business? Are you retiring? Or do you have other interests? Are you bored? Um, are there disputes amongst uh, owners? Uh, is, are there health issues? Uh, is there a capital shortage? How many businesses, business owners come to me and say, I'd like to sell my business? One of the first questions I ask is why? Well, the business isn't doing very well. It's really not making money. Okay, and you want to sell it? Yep. Okay, and who's going to buy your problems? Who's going to pay you to lose money? Or you can, you know, the business is generating 40,000 euros a year. When you can get a job, not pay anything, and make that money or more. Well, but you're expecting somebody to pay you $100,000, right? So these are all very valuable questions to consider. Of course, when is that timing? When should you consider selling that business? What's your current status? Are you prepared? Are there changes in the marketplace? Are there changes that are required in your um, business plan or in your business strategy? Um, what's your goal? Are you trying to retire? Or are you trying to pass on your pain to somebody else? You need to do a gap analysis there. And I always say, a seller should always put themselves in a buyer's shoes. They should always look through the buyer's window and understand what that looks like. Because if you do that, you will succeed in, a tra in transferring your business. If you don't do that, you're going to be at odds. You're going to get what was talked about this morning, remorse and walk away and all that stuff. That's why that happens. Because they don't understand what it looks like from the other side. They only see their own side. If you're a buyer, it's the same thing, by the way. The buyer needs to look through the seller's window as well so that they can see what the seller sees. And then people can better understand each other and come to... Um, to a successful transi uh, transition. Um, one needs to engage the right team, the right professionals, the right people to get the right advice. You need to plan. Plan is critical. Uh, without a plan, you're sure to fail. You have to have a plan. Um, I don't know what the statistics are. I'm sure somebody has done a study and has some of these numbers, but I can tell you that the majority of businesses that sell 
probably could sell for a lot more money if they had planned their exit. I mean, we know statistically wise that only about 10 to 20 percent of all businesses plan an exit strategy. And I think the 20 percent is probably the, the high side. The realistic number from what I understand is more like 13. Um, you need to make decisions. And decisions cannot be made lightly. Do you hold and grow or do you sell and go? Though that, that's the fundamental question. You have to ask yourself that and you have to be honest with yourself. You have to understand where your limits are. Do you have the skill to take it to the next level? Do you have the capital? Do you have the money that will require to be invested in order to take it to the next level? Or even to survive in a changing market? Then, of course, you have to execute. Without execution, you can have the best plan in the world. Without execution, you have nothing. Failure. So you have to execute. You have to take action. No action, no results. So what do you do? You have to assess your situation, where you're at. You have to plan, and then you have to act upon it. Planning, preparation, and execution will put you into what I call a state of change readiness, meaning that you are ready for a change. Whether that change is voluntary or involuntary. Because again, don't forget, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow and you're not prepared, you are not the only one that is going to suffer. You need to think about that. Your family will suffer. Your estate will suffer. Your customers will suffer. Your suppliers will suffer. Your economy will suffer. Your municipality, your province, your state, your country. So we can't be so self-centered as not to think about that. We have to think about it, and that is a reality. You need to be in a state of change readiness so that when the time comes, you are ready and your business is at maximum level, uh, maximum value. Um, let's talk about buying versus starting a business. There was some discussion here earlier, um, but I wanted to highlight some of the points um, of difference between buying and selling. We've talked about selling, um, but investing in a sure thing or a wild card is the question. In other words, when you start a business, and I'm a serial entrepreneur, I've had, uh, I forget now, probably about 17 different businesses in the last 40 plus years in about six or eight different industries. So I have been a serial entrepreneur. And I can tell you, that it's true what they say. Entrepreneurs have a disease. You take the business to a certain level, and then you get bored. You need something else. You need another challenge. Or you don't have enough money to take it where you think the business should go. So you need to be aware of that. Um, is business ownership for you should be the first question that, that is asked. Do you have that entrepreneurial spirit? Um, are you risk tolerant? Because you cannot own a business without accepting risk. Everybody here who is in business for themselves knows that. Uh, and so the next question is, okay, do you start a business from scratch or do you buy an existing business? Well, Irrespective of what the statistics is, I'll tell you what my statistic is in my whatever number of businesses that I've had in the last number of years. Five to seven years is what it takes on average to get a business to start generating income. Five to seven years. Yes, there's the exception to every rule, but you need to count on that. So five to seven years. Let's remember that number. 
when you buy a business, and I'm talking about a smaller business now, uh, or as you guys call it here, micro business, micro, uh, perhaps a business under 2 million euros in enterprise value, okay? I don't know what your average multiple is because I hate multiples as, as a valuator. I think there's more to value than multiples. But I would guess that that multiple will likely be somewhere in the range of 2 to 5. It's a wide range, I understand that, but 2 to 5. That means that if, if your business is generating 100,000 euros in earnings, you will sell that between 2 times that and 5 times that. Okay, and that means that if you're a buyer, you're going to buy that within that range. What that also means is that it will take you between two and five years to get a payback and start making money. So just looking at that range, you can see that buying a business is typically better than starting one. Just buy that because we haven't even considered the risks now. If you, if you put risk into the equation and the statistical facts of how many startups survive two years, three years, five years, 10 years, then, then it's a, it's a no-brainer at that point that buying a business is the way to go. Now, if you're going to buy a business and change everything about it, then you may as well start your own business and risk the failure. Because you're buying a business, you're buying a concept that is making money. Don't go in and change it. Yes, after some time, when you understand it and it's doing well, then you can start implementing some changes. But don't just go in like a bull in a china shop and start changing things because that's sure failure. Risk, as we talked about, uh, the risk of starting a business and succeeding, it's, I mean, the, the, the numbers are staggering and they change um, from survey to survey. And I know that there was a survey that was done by, um, um, in the US, I can't remember who, but they, their numbers were staggering, something like, 10% of all businesses that start up succeed, period. Well, it was over-exaggerated. However, the reality is that um, probably 30% of startups really succeed a reasonable period of time. I'm talking about five to 10 years. And without boring you with statistics, I can tell you from my own personal experience, it's hard work to start a business. It's very hard work. A lot more, a lot harder than buying one and learning. As we talked about five to seven years, there you go, 40% survive four years. These are universal statistics, by the way. Um, failure rates in the US are not any worse or better than failure rates in Canada or in Europe. So I would venture to say that your numbers are pretty much the same. 80% fall within five years. Do you want to take that risk? 10%, actually less than 10%, make it to the 10-year mark. Less than 10%. That's just staggering. So do you want to take that chance? You better know what you're doing, and you better have enough money to take you through that. It's amazing statistics, and they are real, by the way. Buying a business is definitely lower risk than uh, starting one. Two to five years is break even. As I said earlier, I gave you the example of two to five years. I was being 
really conservative, okay? But two to four years is very realistic in a break even when you buy a business. It's a proven concept. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to create new markets. Remember that the market is the size that it is. You're not going to create a new market. You're just going to go into this market by starting a new business, and you will have to steal customers from other people. That is hard work. Not only is it hard work, that is expensive. When you buy a business, you've already got a market. It's already there. All you have to do is build it, increase it. It's a lot easier. It's kind of like, you know, an airplane lands. What do they do before landing? Put the wheels down, right? But what else do they do? They get the wheels spinning. Because if they land with the wheels stationary, they'll probably blow them. So the saying, you know, hit the ground running, proven concept. Buy a business and hit the ground running. Um, the business has a track record. It's already proved itself. You don't have to prove anything. Uh, lending ability. If a business is generating earnings and or already has assets, much easier to borrow money than it is from starting a business. Try going to the bank and saying, uh, I have this concept, I have this idea, I have this patent, I have this business plan, I need to borrow some money. See what they tell you. Most banks will tell you, great concept, great plan, great patent, great everything. However, we can't lend you anything because there's nothing that we can collateralize. There's nothing that we can uh, attach to as security. So if you have a business that's generating earnings, depending what size, they may lend you on cash flow. They certainly would lend you on some assets that you have. And the fact that you have a proven concept already, it's generating earnings, it's got a, an historical track record. If you start up a business, you have no record, no track record, no, no evidence that the business will work. I had a banker once tell me that uh, he says he's never seen a business plan that fails. You have immediate cash flow. As I said earlier, five to seven years before you can start getting some real cash flow. Okay? Instant cash flow if you buy a business, it's already there. The working capital is typically there. And if it's not there, I'm assuming that there has been a, an adjustment in the purchase price to reflect that working capital that is missing, okay? But really, you have instant cash flow. You hit the ground running. You have existing customers. You don't have to steal them from anybody else. There is growth opportunity. The brand is already established. The name is already established. Everything is there. You don't have to recreate the brand and create a name. It's already there. People already know you. That is part of that goodwill. Clients are there. Suppliers are there as well. You don't have to try and find the best supplier, the one that provides you the best price or the best product. They are already there. I mean, that's a huge advantage. When you start up your own business, trying to just, just, just trying to get that in place is a huge task. You will be able to focus on growing the business rather than getting it up and running. And you will be able to do that with it generating cash flow instead of just pumping money in as you would have to if it was a startup operation. Again, key people are in place. You don't have to go out and find the right people. You don't have to teach them how to do the job. They already know how to do the job. 
Everything's in place. How easy is it to find employees or to hire employees in your country today? Is it easy? Who says it's easy? They're already there. You don't have to do that. So it's a calculated or mitigated risk when you buy a business, as opposed to flying by the seat of your pants and in the hope of a prayer that your business will succeed. It's going into it with known risk factors as opposed to unknown risk factors. So definitely less risky, however, it is not risk free. There is no such thing. If you are going to become an entrepreneur, you've got to accept risk. If you want zero risk, entrepreneurship is not for you. I want to tell you, however, that employment isn't risk-free either, because you could get the boot anytime. So, no such thing as risk-free in life. So, evaluate, choose, fund, and run the business. You can do all of that when you buy a business. And I think we will close the session there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mulțumim mult, foarte structurat, foarte bine așezată informația și clară. Cred că ai spus-o mai bine decât oricine și o să fii preacherul nostru de acum încolo. Să te folosim. O să fie all over the You'll have to do the translation because I'm not hearing anything. I said you're going to be our preacher. You're going to be all over the internet with our church and what to preach today. The church of entrepreneurship. Exactly. I, 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 some point I had the, the some, I don't know, for some reason came in my mind the MLM uh, meetings in the United States, you know those <laughs> where, they, where they sell the whatever, you know, the, the, the umbrellas in the sand, the desert or whatever, you know, <laughs> and uh, they do it with so, so much uh, conviction, conviction uh, uh, so much passion that uh, that's something that you need, and I, I I saw that on you, but the difference, the, the biggest difference is that this is reality. This is not an umbrella and a weird place, you know, this is umbrella and Seattle. So it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Pino. So you're going to do the Thank you. questions now. Felicitări pentru prezentare. Felicitări pentru yes, thank prezentare. You. Și întrebarea mea este cât de thank you. Ca sau cât de ușor este pentru un european să cumpere o afacere în Statele Unite. question was, is it difficult for somebody in Europe to buy a business in the US? Uh, the answer to that is no, it is not. Uh, the world is becoming smaller today. And so there's an increased number of international transactions. So it is not difficult. You just have to know and understand the uh, peculiarities, I suppose, of each country that you that, that you want to buy into. So for example, if you were to buy a business in Canada, um, you would be paying approximately 26% in corporate taxes. Uh, if you own the business and 
and you're a Canadian uh, permanent resident or citizenship, um, because the corporation then would be deemed to be a Canadian corporation, your tax basis would be 13.5%, so substantial difference. So you need to know those, those factors. But uh, it is not difficult, uh, and it's... It's happening all the time. Uh, we have uh, people from Europe looking to buy a business in North America, and we have people in North America looking to buy businesses in Europe. Growth by acquisition. Toma Filipovic, de la Pair. Întrebarea mea este. Există un MLS pentru afaceri în Canada și Nord America? Is there an MLS for business transfer in Canada or North America? Um, yes, I understood the question. Uh, Romanian is actually very similar to Italian in many ways, so I do understand some of it. Um, but um, uh, the answer is yes and no. And I'll say this. Um, in North America, and that includes Canada, we have uh, real estate uh, that uh, has an MLS system, and, and, and that's very good, and it's well developed. In business brokerage, it's, it's a very young profession, and so we do not have all of the things that real estate industry has. There are portions of the country, for example, Florida, has their own MLS system for businesses, the whole of Florida. Now, you have to understand that, you know, the, the state of Florida has the same population as pretty much as the whole of Canada. So, you know, they can afford to do that. Uh, we in Canada can't. So, the answer is officially no in some parts of the United States. Uh, such as Florida and California, yes, they do. Uh, if you permit me to add, uh, in Romania, when uh, we started our platform and our CRM for brokerage, we said that it is obligatory to continue an MLS system and to start from the beginning by creating a base of data. Because it will be more difficult to do it. If we start from the beginning, we will have a structure de comunicare și o bază de date pe care să putem intra toți să vedem ce există de bizare, cred că este mult mai bine să începem corect și să mergem în direcția bună. Deci asta e unul dintre lucrurile care ne-am propus să le facem și deja este în funcțiune. Absolut agree. Din experiența pe care o aveți, recomandați să existe sau să căutăm silent partner în croafacere? Are you married? So then you know the challenges of partnership. Arrest my case. Um, Partnership works, um, but in the majority of cases, partnership only works in limited amounts. Um, now, it doesn't mean that partnership is, should be ruled out. Um, you know, you may have a person with the technology or the knowledge and a person with the money. That might be a good fit. Or you may have two people that one understands sales, the other one understands manufacturing, whatever. Uh, as, so long as each person that's in the partnership brings their specific skills to the table, and so long as each person in the partnership respects the other and does not try to uh, do the other person's work um, or, or interfere with the decisions, then a partnership will work. Um, it's when people start meddling in each other's domains that partnerships often fail. Și niciodată combinația alimentară de 50-50. 51, 49 lucrează întotdeauna mai bine decât 50-50.
super! Mulțumim mult, Pino! A fost o prezentare deosebită. Am, să, mi-a venit o idee în timp ce vorbeai. Suntem numai uh, câțiva oameni în sala asta, dar n-am nicio, niciun dubiu că acest număr va crește continuu, pentru că n-am niciun dubiu că mergem în direcția care trebuie. Și ideea care mi-a venit când eram afară, o să, o să folosim o bucată de hârtie, Cine vrea să scrie un e-mail sau un număr de telefon sau orice altceva, o să vă putem trimite din când în informații cu ceea ce facem, ceea ce vrem să mai construim, să stăm cumva conectați. Nu o să vă abuzăm, o să fie cât mai, uh, cât mai rar și cu lucruri importante. Cum a fost această întâlnire din cele două zile, ne-am avut un total de patru zile, poate de puțin suntem obosiți, că am început de miercuri, asta e sfârșitul la noi. Dar cred că a fost deosebit și mă bucur că am avut acești oameni minunați la București, care cred eu că au venit din, din experiența lor să ne spună că aceste lucruri sunt reale, sunt normale, sunt o necesitate. Și trebuie să fim atenți la ele. Planificăm sau nu planificăm? Câștigăm sau pierdem? Cam asta e, cred că e concluzia. Mulțumesc mult și să aveți o zi de... O... Thank you.